हरे कृष्ण टुडे वी डिस्कस थ्री टॉपिक्स एस्टडे वी डिस्कस टू द मूड ऑफ स्टडी द स्क्रिप्चर्स secondly the method of studying scriptures we have seen and today you huh? going okay the sound system in charge is kept to the need for so yeah we discussed yesterday the mood of studying the scriptures and then the method of studying scriptures so today we will discuss the art of learning shlokas for an hour or so or less than that then the mode of teaching scriptures and the method of teaching scriptures three topics we need to discuss uh, either we discuss two topics in the morning in little longer session and evening shorter session one topic or one and a half topics now one and a half topics later <laughs> let's see how it goes uh, i'll be little quick i have a clock also in front of me so in the uh, yesterday's uh, session sessions so we have seen that uh, to learn the scripture we need to hear from a bona fide uh, authorized source and we should also put our efforts to study on our own then we also have to revise it recollect it ruminate on it reflect on it uh, to go deeper into it and then ultimately realize it okay so that's important in our study now while we are studying the scriptures we also have so many shlokas beautiful shlokas in fact all the scriptures most of the scriptures are written in shloka format they are in sanskrit that you hardly find any prose uh, in the fifth canto of bhagavatam there are some prose passages uh, but mostly it's all shlokas so all the scriptures are written in shloka format and our acharyas have very mercifully translated the shlokas into a language that we can understand whether it is english or other languages like hindi uh, marathi malayalam malayalam <laughs> telugu tamil etc uh, but originally they are written as so sanskrit shlokas so how important it is to focus on the sanskrit shlokas that's that will be our discussion in the next uh, few minutes so i'll present 11 reasons why we should learn shlokas and nine tips how we can learn shlokas the why and how in regards to learning shlokas we'll discuss today so uh now first point even yesterday i mentioned this if you love the shloka either for its meaning or for its meter it automatically enters into the memory okay when we love something we tend to repeat it uh, when you are just passing on the road suddenly you hear some song and that attracted your attention for some reason and you tend to just unconsciously also repeat singing that song not knowing to yourself also so it just enters into the memory so getting attracted to the meaning or the meter of the shloka is the first uh, step in memorizing a shloka and by the way it is not necessary and it is not possible also uh, to learn all the shlokas in a scripture there are 700 shlokas in the gita 18000 shlokas in bhagavatam so it's not possible to learn all of them but at least some key shlokas some selected shlokas which acharyas have pointed out for example prabhupad quotes few shlokas very often in his purports mm, like uh, आचार्यम माम विजानीयम नाम अन्यत करहचित इंपॉर्टेंस ऑफ गुरु आचार्य प्रोपर राइट्स इन परपोर्ट सेवरल टाइम्स ही कोट सम ब्रह्म संहित श्लोकस ऑफन ही कोट सम गीता श्लोकस वेरी ऑफन राइट ही कोट्स द स्तत्यनु कंपाम ससमिक्षमान भागवतम श्लोका वेरी ऑफन इन हिज परपोर्ट्स सो दैट सच ऑफन कोटेड श्लोकस आर एनी श्लोका दैट यू फाउंड वेरी टचिंग टू योर हार्ट वेरी पियर्सिंग इन टू योर हार्ट व्हेन यू आर रीडिंग द स्क्रिप्चर so those things you can just note down and then remember try to remember okay so let's see why we have to learn these shlokas why is it important so there are 11 reasons we are going to discuss today so first is that they are the original compositions 
So when you are reading the book uh, that is written by the author in a language, original language that has its own potency. So Prabhupada and other Acharyas took massive efforts to present the original Sanskrit shlokas with their word-to-word -word meanings and translations uh, because the original shlokas are also important. If Prabhupada wanted, he could have given Bhagavad Gita like he has given Nectar of Devotion, like he has given Krishna book, like he has given the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. All these three books you know, right? Uh, Krishna book. It's not a shloka by shloka translation of Bhagavatam, it's a summary. If summary studies are important, Prabhupada would have just written it and it could be faster also. Why Acharyas and Prabhupada has taken so much effort to write every shloka of the scripture and give word by word meaning, as we have discussed yesterday, five aspects of giving the commentary, right? So Pada Cheda, Sandhivi Cheda, uh, then Padarthokti and all that, Vigraha, Vakya Yojana. So they have put a lot of efforts to present the shlokas line by line, word by word because they are important. Slokas are also important, right? Otherwise you could have given summary studies. So there is a potency that is carried in an original composition, right? Vyasadeva has write, directly written, Krishna has directly spoken. So that carries some potency. Second reason is that their original, their compressed wisdom. In a four-line shloka, you have a great meaning, great purport embedded. So, four pages of purport is originating from a four-line shloka, okay? So, it has a special potency. Just like you have compressed files, uh, two MB file, zip file can have 10 MB data, okay, when you unzip it. Okay, yesterday we were discussing about the notes, right? Uh, you can read some book, read a chapter and write notes in a very concise format and then you can expand it later. Similarly, shloka is also like that. Shloka is a compressed uh, format of great wisdom. When you uncompress the shloka, when you unpack it, this deep wisdom that, that we can get equipped with. Even in a normal meeting also, when we are having a managerial meeting, how to organize Narasim Chaturdashi festival, for example, okay, or how to organize a retreat like this, okay. Then there are a few managers who come together, have a meeting, and there's one person, secretary, who is taking minutes of the meeting. Okay? So even in a managerial meeting also, taking minutes, taking notes is important, so that even after one year, we can refer back to these minutes, the highlights of the meeting, and then have the future uh, managerial discussions in this line. That has a good reference, right? So like that, taking notes is very important, to compress things, to keep things in a concise format for future reference. So coming back to shlokas, shlokas also are very concisely written. There is uh, standard chandas, like Anushtup chanda is there, many other meters of the shlokas are there. So, so much of wisdom is compressed into just four lines uh, in certain number of syllables and presented there. So that just by remembering one shloka uh, and knowing its meaning, uh, we can easily expand on it, we can elaborate on it when we are speaking to others. And we can have a lot of food for thought also. It's there. Uh, there is one nice statement made by Krishna Das Kavaraj Goswami in the, in the Adi Leela of Chaitanya Charitamrita. He was defining eloquence. In, in, in Sanskrit, eloquence is called Vagmita. Vagmita means Mitam cha saram cha vachohi Vagmita. Very simple statement. Mitam cha means limited uh, and concise presentation. Saram means essence. Vachohi, vacha means words. Vagmita means eloquence. Vitam cha saram cha vachohi vagmita means essential truth spoken concisely is eloquence. Definition of eloquence is essential truth spoken concisely. You speak only the essence in a very concise manner. No need of, you know, uh, writing a big paragraph or two, three pages of uh, content, just get the essence of it. So all the Shastras are like that. Of course, in Kali Yuga, people may not be able to understand the Sanskrit shlokas directly, therefore commentaries and purports are required. But originally the wisdom is presented, spiritual wisdom is presented, scriptural wisdom is presented in the form of very concise, eloquently written shlokas. 
Okay? So, if we can manage to keep that, that concise statements in our memory, then we can always unpack them, uncompress them and then uh, present it to others and we can, all, we can have our own reflections. Depending on our level of consciousness, the sloka reveals itself to us. Because a lot of meaning is embedded within these four lines. Uh, when we are reading it, depending on the purity of our consciousness, the four lines will reveal either two lines, a four lines sloka will reveal only two lines to you sometimes. Mm -hmm. And four lines sloka can reveal two pages also sometimes, right? Depending on how developed is our consciousness. For example, this sloka is there. Ananya chinta yanto maam yejana paryupasati tesham nitya bhayukta naam yoga kshemam baham yaham. Recently I was speaking on this shloka in that Bhakti Vriksha session. Yoga kshemam baham yaham. Just one line. In this one line, so much meaning is embedded. So Prabhupada translates it in this way. Yoga kshemam baham yaham means I supply whatever my devotees lack and I preserve whatever they have. That's one meaning. And Vishnu Chakra Thakur gives more meanings to it. Yoga Kshema Baham Yaham means, uh, Yoga means our attempt to connect with Krishna. Kshema means Krishna's attempt to reciprocate with our attempt. Okay? So, and Yoga Kshema Baham Yaham, when this word Yoga Kshema Baham Yaham is said by Krishna, it means that Krishna will preserve our Yoga. Means Krishna will protect our Yoga. Krishna will help us in our attempts to connect with Him. And Krishna will reciprocate with that attempt also. Means even whatever inspiration that we have to perform bhakti, to connect with Krishna, it is also coming from Krishna. That's what is mentioned in this Yoga Kshema Vaham Yaham. And, okay, Yoga and Kshema we have multiple meanings. Kshema Vahami means carrying. Vahami basically means carrying. So there is um, the story of Arjuna Charya. How many of you know the story of Arjuna Charya? He did not believe in this, or he did not sufficiently, or he was not comfortable <laughs> to read this line. How can the Lord carry the burden of the maintenance of his devotees? He wasn't comfortable. The Lord carried so much of foodstuff for Arjuna Charya personally, uh, just to prove that I will carry the burden of the maintenance of my devotee. No problem. Right? Yoga Kshama Mahama. Mahama means to carry the burden. Aham means I. I will not outsource this responsibility to some of my incarnations or to some of my assistants like the devatas. I will personally do it. Aham refers to personally the Lord will carry the burden of the maintenance of his devotee. Like that, just this one line has so much meaning. In the first sloka of Bhagavatam, Janma In that one sloka, Prabhupada gives ten pages of purport. And Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur gives five meanings to the same shloka. Same shloka has five meanings. Okay, one meaning is that this shloka describes seven features of the absolute truth. Just like one understanding. Secondly, this shloka talks about bhakti yoga. Third, this shloka talks about uh, Radha Krishna Tattva. Fourth, this shloka talks about uh, Madhurya Rasa. Like that there are multiple meanings of one shloka only. This also shows the richness of Sanskrit language. Right? Prati shloke, prati akshare, nana arthakai. In every word and in every syllable there are multiple meanings. That's how rich Sanskrit language is. That's how uh, Vyasadeva has written all these scriptures, embedding so much of uh, content into it. Right? So, shlokas are uh, just like mathematical formulae providing solutions to various problems in this life, right? So, you, in your mathematics exam, you may find a question that carries 8 or 10 marks, okay? But just one formula, if you know, you can easily crack it. But if you don't know that one little formula, 8 marks is lost, right? Formula is very small, right? <laughs> but that is required. The same thing, uh, slokas have compressed wisdom and very eloquent poetry in that. Poetic Sanskrit shlokas of the scriptures are easier and more enjoyable. Just compare um, remembering one shloka with remembering one English paragraph. English paragraph, because you know the language, you can just summarize and then paraphrase and then speak in your own line, in your own words. But Sanskrit shlokas you can remember as it is, because it's poetry. So, the third reason why we should learn shlokas, uh, to develop Shastra Chakshu. 
we already had sufficient discussion on this that the scriptures and the scriptural shlokas have compressed wisdom and when we keep that wisdom as our lens to see the world okay okay when some happiness or distress is coming in life then we just wear the glasses of matra sparshas to kaunteya sitoshna sukha dukha da you see like this <laughs> right so you three you see through the lens of that shloka 2.14 then it becomes easy for us to tolerate the dualities of this world when some task came we have to be determined so just wear this glasses of 2.41 mm-hmm. ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರಕ್ಷು we can collect some selected shlokas at least if not all shlokas right man mana bho mad bhakto all that so when we store a small shloka in our memory after having studied its meaning and deeper imports of the acharyas its compact wisdom becomes ever available and also becomes uh, comes to our rescue when we need so suddenly you are facing some calamity suddenly some shloka just pops up in your memory that changes the perspective of the situation you know there is a prism so you take a prism and keep it in sunlight as we are moving the prism like this it will emanate different rays of multiple colors very beautiful similarly you take one shloka of gita or bhagavatam and then just look at that uh, with the purity of your consciousness it will emanate multiple perspectives so many wonderful perspectives are emanated from that one shloka and that changes the perspective of uh, uh, the person who is looking at the situation one situation can be seen in multiple perspectives depending on the purity of our consciousness uh, when consciousness is impure although there's something purely spiritual going on we see in the material perspective when the consciousness is uh, pure then even if it is matter we see in the spiritual way so now this is flower okay so in one sense it is material but when it is offered to krishna it becomes spiritual right you are wearing it means you are receiving blessings you are smelling it means your heart is getting transformed so we will develop that spiritual vision scriptural vision right by learning the shlokas then also when you are reciting some shloka it's like associating with spiritual sound fourth point you are associating with spiritual sound vibration pure spiritual sound vibration as it is recorded in gita bhagavatam and other scriptures ya etat shravaye nityam ya makshanam anyadhihi ya makshanam anyadhihi shlokam ekam tadartham va shlokam ekam tadartham va padam padardham eva va padam padardham eva shraddhavan yodu shrunuyat shraddhavan ಶ್ಲೋಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟ್ಲೋಕಂಟಿಂಗ್ಲೋಕ means one line there are four padas right each line is called one pada pada means one fourth of shloka you are reciting padardham va half of one line <laughs> okay shraddha van yo anusruniya if you hear even half a line of a shloka which shraddha which faith in the lord uh, then we can we can connect with krishna easily right we can be benefited spiritually so that is association with spiritual sound pure sound vibration although we don't know the meanings in, as, as children uh, we had this compulsory hour in our school every day morning about 45 minutes all the school children 6 7 8 hundred of us would gather together recite bhagavad gita shlokas recite purusha suktam recite sri suktam recite vishnu sahasrana uh, recite uh, uh, other uh, vedic chants right so there is a 
great synergy, lot of positive energy, lot of spiritual vibrations there. And none of us knew the meanings of any of the things that we are reciting. But the very fact that we are reciting something very pure, we were getting purified. And I would say that little background that I had as a child just facilitated my attraction to a spiritual culture also, to ISKCON also, right? So that spiritual sound vibration, even if you don't know the meaning, that mantra will control the mind, will pacify the mind, uh, will stop the agitation of the mind. Like material sound, sometimes it, it agitates the mind. But spiritual sound, it pacifies the mind. Material beauty agitates the mind with a desire to enjoy it. But spiritual beauty pacifies the mind, uh, consoles the mind, soothes the mind. So that's the effect of spiritual sound coming from uh, the scripture directly. So the mantra itself has some potency. Now, in a, for example, in a temple, some people are offering prayers. Some people are chanting some mantras and some shlokas. Many visitors come. They may not have any understanding of spiritual culture. Uh, they may not be devotees. They may be outright materialists and atheists also. But as soon as they enter the temple and when they hear this chanting of the shlokas, mantras, by some devotees there, their mind becomes calm. Right? They may not accept the philosophy, but the, by hearing the mantra, they become very attracted. Uh, they become very calm and sober and they become very respectful, reverential, right? So that, that spiritual sound vibration, the slokas have that potency to even calm the mind of a materialistic person even for some time, right? So associating with spiritual sound. Then speaking authoritatively, when you're asked to give a class, fifth point, when you're asked to give a class, uh, you may speak in English, that's good, it's appreciated. But if you quote some direct Sanskrit shlokas, statements from the scriptures, your speech is considered more authentic, more bona fide. Yes, he has a reference. He's quoting Vedas, he's quoting Gita, he's quoting Bhagavatam, he's quoting Upanishads. Then your words will be given more importance, much value. If you speak, that has some impact. You may speak something pure also, okay? But if you quote something more pure, then it has more impact. Right? The shlokas have that uh, potency. Then we can learn to offer prayers. At uh, sadhaka level, we may not be able to offer prayers nicely. We may not be able to compose prayers nicely. But already so many prayers are composed. First canto begins with the prayers of Arjuna, then Uttara, then Kunti, then Bhishma. So at least four sets of prayers are there in first canto. You go to second canto, Sukadeva so Goswami's prayers are there. You go to third canto, prayers of the elemental devatas are there, very beautiful prayers. Kardavamuni's prayers are there. Then if you go to fourth canto, Dhruva's prayers, Pracheta's prayers, Prithu Maharaj's prayers, Rudra Gita, Lord Shiva's prayers. Go to fifth canto. There are nine sets of prayers offered by the residents of Jambu Dvipa. Very beautiful. And there are priests of Nabi Maharaj. They offer prayers. Go to sixth canto, Vritrasa's prayers. Go to seventh canto, Prahalad's prayers. 8th canto, Gajendra's prayers. Ninth canto, the prayers offered by uh, Bhagirath and uh, also there were some prayers uh, at the end of ninth canto by Sukadeva Goswami himself. Okay. Then Amshuman offers prayers to Kapiladev in ninth canto. Tenth canto, prayers of the Devatas, prayers of Brahma, prayers of Nagapatnis. So many prayers in tenth canto. Vasudeva's prayers, Devaki's prayers. Go to eleventh canto, Uddhava's prayers. Go to 12th canto, Bhumi Devi's prayers. Every single canto of Bhagavatam has at least one prayer offered by one pure devotee. Okay? And there are many more. Okay? So we don't know how to offer prayers. Just go to Kunti's prayer section and memorize the prayers and just offer. We can connect with Krishna. And one more thing is, if we are offering prayers of Dhruva or Kunti or Bhishma in front of the Lord, you know what happens is we get extra attention. Okay? You go to some office with a recommendation letter by a celebrity. You'll get attention, right? <laughs> Similarly, when we offer our own prayers, the Lord will definitely recognize the prayers. But when we quote Kunti Devi, when we quote Dhruva Maharaj, when we quote Prahalad Maharaj, 
when we repeat the prayers of Gajendra, the Lord will give extra attention because the Lord already has great connection with them. Kunti is very, my very dear devotee. Someone is repeating her prayers. Okay, looks like he got some recommendation from Kunti Devi. Let me give more attention to this guy. <laughs> so the Lord, we get more attention from the Lord by repeating the prayers of great souls. Right? We don't know how to offer prayers. We learn how to offer prayers. Right? So repeating the shlokas and mantras composed by great devotees uh, of the past must be incorporated into our sadhana as proper recommends. Then someone can read this. All of you have the uh, slides, no? uh, you can read this statement so that I... You can read this statement with Prabhupada. You have mic? Yeah, Or I will be. Next time you can plan to read so that we can have some little interaction. There is a mic there, somebody wants to read. Yeah. yeah, you can give. You can give that mic to someone who wants to read. Just but you can keep, to, keep with one devotee only who can read all. <laughs> So each and every verse you should chant very perfectly, nicely, meditate upon it. This is the process of progress, advancement in spiritual life. We should get all these verses by heart and chant and offer prayer to the Lord. This is called Vandanam. Prabhupada writes like this in a lecture. Uh, Prabhupada says the, like this in a lecture. So Prabhupada is recommending that we chant, we recite the shlokas perfectly and nicely. And we should also buy hat some. Okay. So learning to offer prayers. Then seventh is remembering and loving Krishna. Okay. Seventh reason why we have to learn shlokas. We can remember Krishna, we can love Krishna. Just like remembrance of our mother, mother's exact statements of good advice to us reveals our love for her. Mother gives an advice when the child is going to the school. Mother says, hey, don't quarrel with other people child in the school has some, uh, you know, in some situation, the child has to fight with a friend. Generally, the child remembers mother's statement. My mother told me not to get into quarrels with anyone. Okay. That remembrance of mother's exact statement shows how much the child is in connected connection with the mother, right? Connection with the father. So, similarly, when we are remembering uh, exact statements of Krishna or exact statements of uh, some great devotees like uh, Bhishma or uh, Ambarish, etc., their prayers, then uh, we uh, are expressing our love for them. Without love, we don't want to uh, remember someone's statements as they are. Sometimes people may remember statements out of hatred also. <laughs> but generally, when we are remembering someone's statements as they are, there is a lot of love there. So, when we are trying to repeat Krishna's words or some devotee's words, that's one way of cultivating so much love. If you see, many Prabhupada's disciples are giving classes. They quote Prabhupada's statements as they are many times. That shows how much they love uh, Prabhupada. Right? Many disciples of some spiritual master, they quote the statement of spiritual master as it is. So that shows how much they love their Guru. So like that, when we try to remember the scriptural shlokas as they are and try to repeat them, that is one way of developing our love for them, right? Developing our bonding with them, right? So that's also very important. Prabhupada says, Here Kunti Devi, a great devotee, is giving us opportunity. Yes, you want to read? Srila huh? Prabhupada says, Here Kunti Devi, a great devotee, is giving us opportunity to become Krishna conscious. Simply concentrate in your mind on lotus flower. That's all. Lotus flower, as soon as you see a lotus flower, you will immediately think of Namah Pankachanabhaya. Okay. Prabhupada is giving a class on this Kunti's prayers. She says, right? Namah Pankajanabhaya, Namah Pankajamalini, Namah Pankajanetraya, Namaste Pankajangharaye. So as soon as you see, Lotus flower, you remember that prayer. Because Mother Kunti is comparing all the bodily limbs of Krishna with lotuses, right? See lotus, remember Krishna. A nice advertisement, right? See lotus, remember Krishna. <laughs> so, that's one thing. Secondly, when we are accustomed to chant some prayers, when we have some prayers in our memory, uh, like I was seeing Haridev reciting uh, 
prayers of uh, uh, Gajendra so repeatedly on a daily basis. I am hearing his voice, right? So when you are accustomed to remember some prayers on a regular basis, recite some prayers on a regular basis, whenever you are stuck, whenever you face some reversal or some calamity or sudden accident, you naturally remember those prayers only, right? And somebody is just uh, walking on the road, suddenly some bus comes like this. Uh, Radhe Radhe they say, or Krishna Krishna, or uh, the children Amma they say, uh, <laughs> means they are remembering mother, because there is some connection, bonding with the mother, they remember mother naturally. So Bhakti is trying to increase our remembrance of Krishna. And the connection with Krishna is established by offering prayers. Okay. So by, be it land, cra crash landing, or a road incident, or darkness of the night, or some dogs barking in a lone street, whatever it may be, whatever may be the emergency situation or, or uh, accidental situation, you, if you are accustomed to remember some prayers, some Sanskrit shlokas, you naturally tend to chant them, especially devotees chant Narasimha <laughs> prayers. So some sudden difficulty comes, right? Your heart is just beating at a faster rate. He said, Ugrabhiram Mahavishnum Jalantam Sarvatomukham Narasimham Bhishanam Bhadram Mrityor Mrityor Namamiham He kind of spontaneously offered that prayer. For that, you need to have some shlokas in the memory, some prayers in the memory. <laughs> right. So, it's savior in difficult times. We need to seriously prepare for the most important examination, which is death. Life is a preparation, death is an examination. So, at the time of death, we may not be able to remember many things, but somehow if we practice some mantra, some shlokas, some prayers, we will be able to remember them uh, at the time of death. That's one way of uh, connecting with Krishna. So, how does shloka learning help us do this? Yeah, you can read. How does shloka remembrance help us? Help us do this. Keep playing originally in our mind. Organically in our mind. Organically in our minds. Spontaneously appear in our mind. And we keep singing them even unconsciously and involuntarily. So when you learn a prayer, when you learn a shloka, it's just repeatedly playing within. Right? As if you have left a tape recorder on, okay, and the music is on continuously in the background, like that it's just going on in the background, unconsciously, involuntarily. Right? Without putting a conscious effort, it just keeps on playing within. Then when death comes to receive us, then the shlokas also start playing. Right? So that playing, unconscious playing of the shloka or mantra also invokes the presence of the Lord. Najamil chanted Narayana, Narayana at the time of death. And Lord Narayana came there. Although he did not intend to call Lord Narayana, he was only calling his son. Because Ajayamil was so attached to his son Narayana, so he was calling Narayana Narayana to indicate his son, but original Lord came. So similarly, when we have some prayers in your memory, even if you unconsciously chant, because the prayers are uh, describing the glories of the Lord, the Lord will come. Gajendra also offered prayers. He did not specifically call Narayana, please come, Krishna, please come, Rama, Narasimha, Varaha, Vama. He did not call any Lord specifically. He just uh, chanted some prayers that are describing the glories of the Supreme God. Gajendra's offering of prayer is to whomsoever it may concern. Whoever has all these qualities, may you come and protect me. That's what Gajendra meant. <laughs> Gajendra did not specifically call a particular Lord, okay, particular form of Lord, right? There must be some creator of the universe, some controller in the universe. There must be some Jagadishwara, whoever may be the Jagadishwara, whoever it may be, let him come and protect me, like that. <laughs> so, even unconscious chanting also is very potential. Every devotee should practice in order to chant some mantra, perfectly. So that even though he may be imperfect in spiritual consciousness in this life, in his next life, he will not forget Krishna consciousness. Even if one gets an animal body, one can remember those prayers. Prabhupada says this. Helpful in the next life also. That's the ninth reason. You want some help in the next life also? Let's have some prayers in the memory. <laughs> That's why Prabhupada says that um, uh, we have to practice learning some prayers. Brahma Samhita Prabhupada gives examples. Narasimha Stotra, definitely Hare Krishna Mantra, and Brahma Samhita also proper adds, right? So even if you are attached to the music of the prayers, even if you don't know the meaning of Brahma Samhita, you are just chanting. 
Brahma Samhita, right? That will also help. That will invoke the presence of the Lord, protection of the Lord. And Prabhupada personally recommends this. Simply by chanting the mantra, you will be purified, even if you don't know the meaning. Even if you don't understand a single word, if you just chant, this vibration has its power. Sarnvatam Svakatha Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtanaha Punya Shravana Kirtanaha Shravana and Kirtana of all these slokas of Bhagavatam Gita and all, that is Punya. And this is not ordinary material Punya. Material Punya means that which takes you to Svargaloka. Material piety takes to Svargaloka. But spiritual piety is there, spiritual Punya, that takes us to the spiritual world, Vaikuntha Arkaloka. Okay? So, one who is chanting these words and one who is hearing these words is becoming pious automatically. That's why Prabhupada has given this morning uh, Bhagavatam class format where the speaker recites the shloka few times and the audience also recites the shloka few times. Everything is recited line by line so that that vibration of chanting of that shloka will purify the whole ether. First, about 4-5 minutes is spent in just reciting that one shloka in group by multiple people. At least speaker three times, Mataji three times, Prabhuji three times, at least nine times. All of us are reciting same shloka nine times in the morning program, minimum. <laughs> okay? Your kids are getting excited more times. <laughs> right? So, Prabhupada recommends. You enjoy the format also like that. Tadeva, 11th shloka, 11th reason. It's a great pleasure basically. It's joy. So, many in, in our children classes, many kids may not know the meaning, but they are so excited to recite shlokas. If there is an excitement, there is joy in it, in learning, even if you don't know the meaning. Even if you know the meaning, you may not be able to apply that meaning or lesson in your life immediately, but still, it's exciting, it's joy. Tadeva ramyam ruchiram navam navam Tadeva Shashvan Manaso Mahotsavam Tadeva Shokar Navaso Shanam Drunam Yadutta Mashloka Yesho Adugiyate Tadeva Ramyam Ruchiram Navam Navam All these great shlokas of Bhagavatam are Ramyam, very enchanting. Ruchiram, very tasty. Navam Navam, they appear near and near. Have you ever seen one shloka you have recited hundred times? Still it appears new, right? You, you feel like reciting the same shloka again. Then, Tadeva Shasvan Manaso Mahotsam, it's a perpetual festival for the mind to constantly recite. That's there in the background, just going on like songs, okay? And music has that potency. Even material music also has the ability to completely occupy the consciousness or mind of a person who gets attracted to that music, right? If material music has that potency, what to speak of spiritual, pure sound vibration, it has more potency to occupy our minds. If only we expose our minds to that potency, okay? So, Tadeva Shokarnava Soshanam Duna means Shoka Aranava, ocean of lamentation. When we get absorbed in these prayers of Bhagavatam, then the ocean of lamentation created by our tears is dried up within a moment, right? So, Yaduttama Shloka Yashonu Giyati. One of the names of the Lord is Uttama Shloka. <laughs> we are discussing the art of learning shlokas, right? One of the names of the Lord is Uttama Shloka. One who is glorified in best shlokas, best poetry. So, let us try to learn some shlokas about Uttama Shloka. <laughs> so, these are 11 reasons uh, why we should uh, uh, learn shlokas, right? So there is this beautiful shloka from Bhagavatam. Nivritta darshai upagi yamana bhavaushadhat srotramano bhirama ka uttama shloka gunanu vada Kumaan virajjeta vinapa shughnat. Nivritta tarshai rupagiya mana. Who can enjoy Bhagavatam? Who can relish the pastimes of Krishna? Those who are completely devoid of their tarsha. Tarsha means hankering for material enjoyment. Nivritta tarshai rupagiya mana. Those who have given up their hankerings for material enjoyment have glorified Krishna upagiya mana. 
and that glorification is bhava aushadhara it's like medicine for material existence shrotra mana abhirama shrotra means ears mana means heart abhirama means very attractive all these glories of the supreme lord sung by great devotees are very attractive to the ears with their sound and to the heart with their meaning right shrotra mano abhirama ka uttama shloka guna anuvada puman virajyet vina pashughnat so the second half of the shloka says ka uttama shloka guna anuvada who will give up an opportunity to hear the glories of lord uttama shloka unless he is a butcher or a killer of soul right if you are not taking pleasure in hearing the glories of the lord you are considered killers of souls why are you starving the soul right one who starves one's body will only meet death very soon similarly one who starves one's soul from the real food of hari katha uh, they will only um, attain spiritual death right so pashughanat okay so that's why bhagavatam shloka is very attract to, to the ears and mind and let's learn nine tips how to learn shlokas very simple tips quick in nine minutes we will complete this first as i said fall in love with the shloka <laughs> okay so we already discussed it love a shloka love for a shloka makes it stick to our memory spontaneously naturally and for a long time somehow you heard something some shloka and you just immediately fell in love with its meter or meaning or melody then it just uh, enters the memory then hmm, establishing some connection admiration or love with the speaker or the writer or the context of the shloka will also make us remember the shloka easily when you're reading a past time so gajendra's prayer came in a very very attention attracting context thousand years of fight between a crocodile and an elephant and when you're first time reading this story so that moment is really an exciting moment isn't it okay so it's a very crucial moment very vital uh, point of time at that time what did gajendra do offered prayers naturally the prayers will get maximum attention why bhagavad gita is kept uh, at such strategic point in mahabharat like these two big armies of uh, pandavas and the kauravas are coming at one point suddenly there's a pause for krishna to speak bhagavad gita okay so that pause is important where we get maximum attention right so where there is uh, um, like where there is maximum footfall where like for example why we are so many programs on sunday hmm? why not on uh, wednesday <laughs> why not on monday and a very heavy working day we are organize a program on sunday so that people are free and you get maximum attention similarly many prayers also are put in strategic points in our scriptures kunti offering prayers or gajendra offering prayers Uh, or many other personalities offering prayers they are kept in strategic points bhagavad gita krishna speaking bhagavad gita he it is also kept in mahabharata at a very very attention attracting moment of the story line right so when we try to establish a connection with the context when we are excited while reading uh, then we naturally uh, become very curious what's going to happen next then the, some prayer comes and our attention goes on to the prayer okay then we can easily learn so try to develop some absorption while reading the past time you will naturally become curious to know what's going to happen next and then a prayer is kept there an important shloka is kept there <laughs> okay so so basically develop some relationship with the context and relationship with the personality who is offering prayers relationship with the book or oh, this book like mm, i just read heard a few prayers of uh, prabodhananda saraswati he has very beautiful shlokas he has very long shlokas generally he writes like sandhya vandana bhadramastu bhavato bho snana tubhyam namo bho deva pitarascha tarpana vidhau na haksham haksham yatam so this shloka uh, propad quotes in one of the purports of bhagavad gita it just got attracted it this attracted my attention then i started searching 
What are the other shlokas that are written by Prabodhananda Saraswati? Then I found little more, few more jewels. Okay. Then there is one shloka which is written in a particular meter. Kalyanam nidhanam kalimalam dhanam pavanam pavananam patheyam yanmu mukshu saparipada pardat praptaye prochyamanam. So I just somehow fell in love with this meter. I started searching for shlokas of this meter. Right? So Kunti Maharani offered prayers. Okay? I fell in love with the prayers and where else she did she offer prayers? I found some prayers in 10th canto. Okay? She offered some prayers to Krishna. When Akurura went to Hastinapur. Okay, you just go and then gather some points there also. Like that you fall in love with the context or the personality or the meter or the author, then naturally you have more uh, opportunity, more excitement to learn the shloka. Right? So fall in love, first point. Second, hear and pronounce. So first is more about heart. Next, I am speaking the real methods. Hear the shloka. When someone is pronouncing the shloka nicely, reciting the shloka nicely, you hear that recitation and you start pronouncing. That's what Prabhupada said. In the morning Bhagavatam class, the speaker is reciting the shloka and the audience are hearing that recitation and repeating it. So hear and pronounce. Uh, while being involved in some physical activity that doesn't really demand a lot of attention, we can just put some sloka recitations in the ear. Okay? You can switch on the, uh, what is that, tape recorder, mobile phone nowadays. Okay? Put that. <laughs> Recitation is going on, you are doing your work. Right? Mind is there. Hands are working because they are accustomed to do that work. So, Prabhupada gives this uh, idea. Many devotees remembered most of the prayers being chanted in the morning program. So morning program, samsara dava nala lidha loka. If you just attend Mangalarti for few days or few months, automatically the prayers will enter the mind. You, you may not hold a book while Mangalarti is going on. Because you have attended Mangalarti several times, you are hearing it and you are pronouncing it, uh, just following the singer, automatically they enter the memory. Narsimharati, Tulsi Arati and all that. Hear and pronounce. Then, third is... Try to recite the shlokas in a tune, proper tune. If you read a shloka as if it's an English sentence, prose sentence, you may not be able to remember it. So try to find out some tune that suits you, that you can easily recite, that you can happily recite. So most of the shlokas are written in few meters, right? Like there are few tunes, like Anushtuk Chanda is there. You will find hundreds and thousands of shlokas written in Anushtuk Chanda. You try to recite a shloka written in Anushtuk Chanda in a particular meter. Vyavasayatmika buddher eke ha kurunandana bohushatha hyanantascha buddhayo vyavasayina. Just get familiar with this tune. You can recite hundreds of shlokas in the same tune. Now, what is the benefit of reciting the shloka in a particular tune? Because tune is in your memory. You may recite thousand shlokas in the same tune. Once the tune sits in your memory, while reciting the shloka, even if you happen to miss some words in that shloka, you will realize it. Because whatever words you are remembering, they are not fitting into the tune which is in the memory. Tune and the lyrics are not matching. <laughs> okay? So because the shloka is written in the same meter only, you will realize that I am missing some words. Vavasayatvika ekeha. Something is not matching. Something is missing there. You will realize it. Okay? So that's because there is some buddhi there. Okay? Sometimes some problem is, when you see, tune sits in the memory, you try to put some other word there. <laughs> which, which matches the tune. That's another problem. I can doing sometimes. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So the tune, once it's fixed in your mind, uh, you will realize that you are forgetting some words. So catch your hum. And fourth, if it is too overwhelming to recite one full shloka completely, just break it and repeat it. So this is what I do in our uh, sessions. Matras parshas tu kaunteya. Repeat it five times. Matras parshas tu kaunteya. Matras parshas tu kaunteya. Matras parshas tu kaunteya. So repeat five times or ten times or seven times, whatever is required for you. So break the uh, shloka into parts and then try to learn it part by part. So. Uh, in, in the Japa book written by His Grace Bhurijan Prabhu, he says, listening 
to one round seems overwhelming listen to one mantra at a time then he also breaks it down he says one one name at a time okay hari krishna hari krishna one mantra becomes so overwhelming is decide one word so like that one full shloka reciting becomes little too much just you go line by line so today you learn only two lines tomorrow you can learn two lines okay and five times or 10 times up to you so minimize the task of the mind by breaking the shloka into smaller parts and learning it line by line for example there is a big shloka okay you may not recite it line by line you may have to recite half line at a time pana pada padartham we discuss sometime right let's later recite this हे गोपाल हे कृपा जल निधे हे सिंधु कन्यापते हे कम शांतक हे गजेन्द्र करुण पारीण हे माधव हे रामानज हे जगत्रय गुरो हे पुंडरी कक्षम हे गोपी जननाथ पालय परम जानामी न सो दिस इज फोर लाइन श्लोक बट यू कैन ब्रेक इट इंटू एट पार्ट्स ओके one line at a time shall we try this he gopalaka he krupa jalanidhe he gopalaka he krupa jalanidhe one more tip if you recite loudly you will remember it faster <laughs> he gopalaka he krupa jalanidhe he gopalaka he krupa jalanidhe he gopalaka he krupa jalanidhe he gopalaka he krupa हे सिंधु कन्यापते हे सिंधु कन्यापते हे कम शांतक हे गजेन्द्र करुण पारीण हे माधव हे कम शांतक हे गजेन्द्र करुण पारीण हे माधव हे रामानुज हे जगत्रय गुरो हे पुंडरी कक्षम हे रामानुज हे जगत्रय गुरो हे पुंडरी कक्षम हे गोपी जननाथ पालय पराम जानामी नाम सो दिस सिंपल मीनिंग हे गोपाल का सो इज ऑफरिंग प्रेयर टू गोपाल हु इज गोपाल द कोहेड बॉय ऑफ वृंदावन कृष्ण हे कृपा जला निधे रणोष्ण मर्सी हे पुंडरी का क्षम ओ लॉर्ड यू हैव नोटिस लाइक आईस हे सिंधु कन्यापते सिंधु कन्या मीन्स मदर लक्ष्मी शी टू बर्थ फ्रॉम दिस ओशन देर फॉर शी इज कॉल्ड सिंधु कन्या शी इज द डॉटर ऑफ ओशन एंड हिज पति ऑफ लक्ष्मी देर फॉर हिज हे सिंधु कन्यापते हे कंसांत का हे स्टिल कंसा गजेंद्र करुणा ही ऑफर डोबेशन ही ऑफर मेरसी टू गजेंद्र पारीण हे माधवा आई हैव सरेंडर्ड एंड टू यू यू प्लीज प्रोटेक्ट मी माधवा ओ हजबेंड ऑफ गॉड इज फॉर्चून हे रामानुज So Rama is Balaram here. Rama no jay is the younger brother of Balaram. That is Krishna. Okay. Hey Rama no jay. Hey Jagatre Guru. Krishna Mandi Jagat Guru. He is the real teacher, spiritual master of all the three worlds. Hey Pundari Kaksham. You have lotus like eyes. Hey Gopi Janatha. You are the master of all gopis. Pala ya Param. Please protect me. Please maintain me. Jana me natvam vina. I don't know any other shelter other than you. Simple prayer. Just break it into small pieces. Try to relish it, okay. So when you try to relish it, automatically we will remember it, okay. Relish comes by remembrance, and remembrance also comes by relish, <laughs> both ways. So allocate some time. Fifth tip: allocate some time, right, for reading shlokas, for reciting shlokas, preferably on a daily basis. You select some ten shlokas, 
उनके सम वेरी की श्लोकस फ्रॉम गजेंद्रस प्रेयर्स और फ्रॉम कुंतीस प्रेयर्स यू सेलेक्ट सम 10 श्लोकस एंड योर टारगेट इज टू लर्न देम इन वन वीक सो एवरी डे मॉर्निंग से 7:00 ओक्लॉक फॉर व्हाट एवर टाइम सूट्स यू 10:00 ओक्लॉक यू स्टार्ट रिसाइटिंग दिस 10 श्लोकस टू रिसाइट 10 श्लोकस यू मेनी 2 3 मिनट्स डिपेंडिंग ऑन योर पेस सो यू एलोकेट 10 टाइम 10 मिनट्स in the 10 minutes you can recite this 10 shlokas at least 3 or 4 times at the same time every day morning 10 am to 10 10 am you are reciting this 10 shlokas 3 or 4 times each and like that you do it for next 10 days all the 10 shlokas will go into your memory in the same order so you try to allocate some time and and then repeatedly recite the same thing one more key is that you can write the shloka with your own handwriting okay so see the shloka write it in your own handwriting take some card write it on it and then keep looking at it right with your handwriting if you write na you will become more and more familiar with the pronunciation if you directly read from the book if you are little experienced and seasoned you can catch it but if you are little new then see the shloka and then write it in your own handwriting and while writing only you try to keep little longer phrases in your memory okay hey go palaka hey kripa jalanidhi you can say hey go pa you may not look at the shloka for every syllable uh, but you try to keep little bigger chunks in the memory and try to read see and write and after some time without seeing you write right that will also be uh, that's why we we conduct shloka exams written shloka tests okay then oral shloka tests are also there <laughs> so if you keep a piece of paper and then write and you can uh, open that uh, paper every now and then and then see and you are not doing something which requires too much of your attention you are walking from here to there you just pick up that okay put it back and then try to uh, uh, practice it right this one beautiful shloka fullen devara kanti mindu vadanam barhavatam sapriyam श्रीवत्सुधरोपीनायनोत्पलाचितोपृत गोविंदम कलवेणुवादन परम दिव्यांग भूषम भजे सो यू ट्राइ टू रीड राइट द श्लोका विथ योर ओन हैंड एंड देन ट्राई टू रिसी रिपीटेडली सी इट एंड रिसाइट इट लाइन बेला सेवेंथ टिप सो रिसाइट इन एसोसिएशन वेन यू ट्राई टू लर्न श्लोका एलोन यू कैन स्टिल डू इट it takes some time when you try to recite this shloka in the company of two three other devotees 10 other devotees that combined recitation of 10 people that that audio that loudness <laughs> of 10 recitations together 10 uh, voices together that will uh, just find its way into your memory the shloka will find its way into your memory right so try to do it in the company of your like minded friends who also aspire to read the same shloka <laughs> in uh, and memorize the same shloka then eighth tip is if you know the meaning uh, that will also be an impetus for you to remember the meaning of the shloka is so attracted to your heart for some reason then if you try to um, learn the shloka because you know the meaning you start repeating the meaning in your classes when you are sharing with others they will say what is the reference then you are start quoting the shloka also right so that becomes more authentic So, for example, this shloka is there. Samo ham sarva bhuteesho nami dveesho stina priya ham ye bhajinti to ham bhaktiya mai teje shi japya ham. So, try to learn the meaning of the shloka line by line, maybe phrase by phrase. Samo ham means I am equal to all. Sarva bhuteesho means towards all living beings. Nami dveesho sti I don't hate anyone. Na priya ha I don't favor anyone. Ye bhajinti to ham one who worships me. Bhaktiya with devotion, mai te I am there in him, uh, they are in me, and te shu chapya ham I am there in them. So like that you break 
the shloka into smaller parts. Prabhupada has already given word by word meaning. You may generate line by line meaning or phrase by phrase meaning. I keep doing this for Subodhan many times and in your shloka classes also. If you try to learn the meaning of the shloka also line by line or phrase by phrase or sentence by sentence, that makes it easy. And try to identify the main theme of the shloka. So when you try to analyze that shloka, get into word to word meaning of the shloka and overall message that is given by the shloka, try to develop some relationship with all these aspects of the shloka, shloka will sit in the memory, right? So try to know the meaning. Then try sharing with others. When you learn a shloka, uh, if you don't share it with others, you may lose the shloka also. You have learned it, you have kept in your memory, it was there for 10 days, but you have never used it again. You have learned and you have forgotten. <laughs> okay, many things happen like that. Since childhood we have learned so many things we have forgotten because we are not reusing it repeatedly. right? So therefore, let us try to share with friends while taking prasad. You know what? Today I have learned this shloka. And you start saying the shloka and meaning. It takes two minutes or one minute. That exercise will help you remember the shloka well and it will also uh, build your relationship with other devotees and make your conversation more spiritual. We want to make our conversations more and more spiritual. Uh, why as devotees we have to have mundane conversations? Uh, why we have to speak about trivial subject matters? Because we are devotees, right? Let's have some devotional conversations. So let's try to bring in Krishna Katha into our conversations, private conversations. We don't, we don't have to feel shy in sharing our appreciation for Krishna. We don't have to feel shy in glorifying Krishna in our one-to-one -one conversations. Okay. So these are some tips, nine tips. Mm, yeah, there are many such beautiful shlokas. I thought of practicing them, but let's move ahead in our discussion. Uh, let me complete with this. Krishna Tulya Bhagavata Vibhu Sarvashraya Prati Shloke Prati Akshare Nana Arthakaya. So this comes from uh, Bengali Shloka Chaitanya Chaitanya Amrit. Krishna Tulya Bhagavata. Bhagavat book is as good as Krishna himself. Uh, Vibhu Sarvashraya. Just like Krishna is the shelter of everyone, Bhagavatam is also shelter of everyone. Okay. Then Prati Shloka, in every Shloka, Prati Akshare, in every word or in every syllable, Akshara, Nana Arthakai, there are multiple meanings. So the more we read the same Shlokas of Gita, Bhagavatam, the more content, the more insights they have to reveal to us. Right? We can learn much more uh, from one Shloka by repeatedly reading. It's not that you read once and you learn something and you are done with it. Because the shloka has many more things to reveal, right? Just because you meet one person for one hour, it's not that you are done with that person. Even if you meet that person on a daily basis, he has something to reveal to you. Okay? Because he's a person, right? Similarly, the book Bhagavatam, her book Bhagavad Gita is also a person. So, Vedaha Puranam Kavyam Cha Prabhur Mitram Priyeva Cha Bodhayam Titihi Prahu Trivrit Bhagavatam Punaha So, Vedas teaches like uh, Prabhu, like masters, and Puranas, teachers like Mitra, friends, and Kavyas, means poetic words, they teach us like lover, and Bhagavatam does all three, you got it? <laughs> so Vedas teaches like masters, Puranas teaches like friends, and uh, Kavyas, poetic words teaches like lovers, Bhagavatam has all three, that's the richness of Bhagavatam's language. Philosophically, Bhagavatam is rich. Pastime wise, story wise, Bhagavatam is rich. Sweetness wise, Bhagavatam is extremely rich. Bhagavatam has so many descriptions of Krishna's uh, sweet qualities. Uh, there is the shloka that the Mathuravas is saying. As soon as they saw Krishna in the Kamsa uh, Rizaling arena, there all the Mathura ladies started appreciating the fortune of the gopis. Oh, the gopis are so fortunate. They were able to see the beautiful form of Krishna on a daily basis. But we are so unfortunate that we are seeing Krishna being attacked by these mountain Krishnas of Kamsa. They were concerned. In that context, they said, Gopya tapah ki macharan yadamushya rupam lavanya saramasam ardhamananya siddham 
ಬ್ಯೂಟಿ Ananya Siddham, where did Krishna get this beauty? Krishna got this beauty uh, not from an outside source, it's innate in him. It is his natural characteristic. Ananya Siddham, Drubhihi Pibanti Anusava Abhinavam. The more you look at Krishna's beauty, the more he appears beautiful. Right? Anusava Abhinavam, he appears near and near. Durapam, very rarely attainable darshan of Krishna. Uh, Durapam. Etanta Dhamma Yashasha Hasriya Aishwarasya That form of Krishna is the one and only abode of all opulences like beauty and wealth and name, fame, prestige, wisdom, strength Everything is there in that one form Like that the gopis of Vrindavan are glorified by the ladies of Mathura For their fortune of seeing Krishna So like that there is a lot of rasa in Bhagavatam Lot of tattwa in Bhagavatam Lot of leela in Bhagavatam Rasa tattwa, leela tattwa Bhakti tattwa Krishna Tattva, Bhakta Tattva, all Tattvas are there in Bhagavatam. So we can just equip ourselves with all this understanding given by the scriptures. So these are few tips of how to learn shlokas and why to learn shlokas. 11.34. So I will conclude here this particular session. Any questions or comments before we go to the next? Yes, Prabhu. So many. I saw Prabhu's hand first. Mm-hmm. ಮೀಟರ್ I don't know much about the meters. The chandas I don't know. Grammar, grammar and all, you can ask some experts in grammar. But as far as tunes of recitation, melodies. Yes. Uh, melodies are there, like we have so many devotees are reciting in multiple melodies. Uh, you can see in Iskand Desire Tree also. Uh, you want some links? Yeah, there are some links. Iskand Desire Tree, you can find so many links are there. Huh? Yeah, you can search. Uh, Yeah, my website is also there. <laughs> Multiple tunes for each shloka. Huh? Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Uh, Prabhu, Prabhu has already sung all the different prayers uh, in, the, in his website, so you can refer to that. Um, one, one point if you can make it up, because this is uh, the shlokas if we memorize and if we can use that in preaching, then that becomes... Uh, it's like a preaching for one one's own self actually so that way it is uh, it's not just like a theoretical learning just uh, when we apply the this thing in the classes or whatever you are meeting and then then we use the shloka quote the shloka then as you said is more authentic and then we can practically use that shloka in our uh, preaching purposes then equipment if it keeps on using then then you get more benefit of that and otherwise we forget that shloka and then it goes out of our memory or our mind thank you yes yes basically when we are quoting the shloka as it is we are giving utmost prominence to the scripture itself not that i can explain it in a better way no it's already presented in a most enchanting way let me just present it as it is and as a humble menial servant let me just you know i elaborate on it in a language that is understood by the audience right we are trying to give a uh, great prominence and uh, importance to the acharyas and by quoting them the way they have written right as it is okay any other thank you prabhu any other question prabhu my question was in line with what prabhu has asked um when we look at a shloka a particular shloka is there a way to identify what tune will fit it with that shloka yeah. basically there are few prominent chandas prominent meters anushtup chanda is a common thing 
So you can sing that one slogan, ten different tunes. Like you have this sloka, Sarva dharman parityajya mami kam sharanam vraja Aham tvam sarva pape bhyo moksha ishyami ma suchaha same shloka, you can decide another thing. Sarva Sarvadharman parityajya mami kam sharanam vraja Aham tvam sarva pape bhyo moksha ishyami ma suchaha Another thing. So same shloka, you can decide in multiple tunes. You just see what uh, is more comfortable to you. You just select some tune that you are comfortable to recite and then many shlokas will just fall into that uh, category. And there are little longer shlokas. Saveda dhatu padavim parasya duranta viryasya rathanga pani It's a little longer shloka. Yo maya ya santata ya navritya bhaje tatatpa gandham In Anushtup Chandra you will find only eight syllables in one line. Total thirty-two syllables in one shloka. But there are other shlokas that are little longer. Mm-hmm. I don't remember, I don't know the count, but I just have the tune, I just recite like that. There is another shloka, this Dharma Projita, Bhagavatam shloka, very long shloka. It has about 19 syllables in one line. It's equivalent to two end of lines of an average Anushtup Chandra shloka. So, like two end of times, what is this shloka? Dharma Projita Kaita Votra Paramo Nirmat Saranam Satam. That is one line which is equal to two end of lines of Sarva Dharman Parachitya Shloka. So you have these three prominent meters in Bhagavatam and there are very unique meters like Bhishma Stuti, they are sung in a different tune. If you just remember these three, mainly two, Sarva Dharman Parachitya tune and there is like, uh, I mentioned right, uh, other one, what is that, Savita Dhatu Pasavim Parasya. If you remember these two tunes, most of the Bhagavatam Shlokas you can recite. Okay. Thank you. Too sufficient at this moment. <laughs> Next. Any other question, comment? Hare Krishna Guru. Uh, just listening to your uh, recitation is so wonderful. You know, the tune, the mantra, the chandas, uh, it's so wonderful. So, my question is like, I'm basically I've been called a musically deaf. <laughs> so basically saying that, like it's very hard for me to, you know, get a tune and say in that tune, uh, you know, kind of thing. And you mentioned like, you know, they only, if you remember these two or three tunes, uh, you know, then you can actually do the whole lot. Yeah. So, um, so my question is like, if someone like you will find it very, very hard, <laughs> even like, you know, any tune, like, uh, kind of thing, you know, what would he suggest, like, keep on hearing it yeah. continuously in that tune? Uh, we already discussed nine mind. tips about it. <laughs> so you can uh, select uh, only few shlokas uh, uh, that can be recited in just a couple of tunes and then stick to that, that basic is sufficient. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, some kirtanias are there, they sing hundred different ragas mm-hmm. and some devotees are there. Whenever you ask them to sing, they will sing only one tune. <laughs> they, they have become more familiar with that tune. That's right. <laughs> uh, and some devotees don't know much musical instrument like me, okay? We don't know much musical We never had time to learn all that. That's fine. You can just stick to whatever you are comfortable with. And as I said right in the beginning of the session, remembering shloka is not mandatory. Knowing the meaning of the shloka and trying to sincerely apply the message of the shloka in life is more important than just keeping the shloka in memory. So, but it has its own spiritual potency, that's why we have spent one hour discussing about it. But it's not mandatory. Some, for some devotees it's not natural, it's okay, no problem, not an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, bro, one more devotee from there, somewhere. Yeah. Yes, bro. I want to ask about the meanings of shloka in mm-hmm. like, you know, can have different meanings. Uh, some of my friends, you know, ask uh, that, you know, why you present your meanings mm-hmm. and when you say that can have five meanings. And I was, uh, you know, thinking of you mentioned about Rama and Jain, there, there was, you know, Balaram as well. And so, but other people can have different meaning of that. 
So how to verify that which one is to follow? And then people will say, oh, but you're just presenting your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sanskrit is one language that can be subjected to multiple interpretations. And as we discussed yesterday also, uh, the meanings of the Sanskrit words are not eternally freezed in a dictionary. They take on different meanings according to the context. We saw Atma can have multiple meanings, sometimes soul, sometimes super soul, okay? Sometimes mind, Atmana, Atmanam. Uddhare Atman Atmanam Atmanam Avasadayet. Four Atmas you found in two lines. Okay. Uddhare Atmana Atmanam means by soul you, you deliver soul. No. By your mind you control yourself. Right. Uddhare Atmana Atmanam. Use your mind to control yourself. So basically uh, uh, the understanding is the Sanskrit shlokas can have multiple meanings. Which meaning is more authentic, more bona fide? We need to understand by seeing the source of that explanation. If that explanation is given by a bona fide Vaishnava Acharya, we accept that meaning as authentic. Okay? Uh, but if it is given by someone who is not following the uh, Vaishnava line, uh, who is not following the process of Bhakti Yoga himself, just academically and scholarly is giving some kind of interpretation. We may not give so much of importance to such interpretations, right? Sometimes the interpretation is given to suit one's own agendas, okay? That we don't do. And sometimes although we extract some lessons from our Bhagavatam pastimes or some different shlokas, if they are in line with the teachings of Parampara, then we accept them. We may read between lines, but in line with the teachings of Parampara not outside the uh, book, right? So, as long as our Vaishnava Siddhanta is not being compromised, as long as the meanings that we are finding in shlokas are aligning with the overall message of the scriptures, then we accept them as bona fide. If there is any upper Siddhanta, we may not accept them, right? And, uh, and why we rely so much on the Vaishnava Acharyas? Because they are more closer to the Lord. I was giving that example at uni <laughs> yesterday. Uh, you, I may not understand, but you understand the context. Because all the Acharyas are close to the Lord, they understand the heart of the Lord when He is speaking some shloka in the Gita. So we accept their uh, explanations as most authentic uh, than some scholar presenting in a different uh, style. Does it make sense, Ru? Does it answer the question? No. Thinking, you know, you were also talking yesterday that we read a uh, text, you know, as a book. Uh, spiritual text and then we are also trying to uh, put our own deep thinking to that. Sometimes I feel like, you know, when I hear people that can go like their own personal opinion as well. Mm -hmm. But then you're saying if that's coming very well, that should be accepted. It should be accepted. You can read first canto of Bhagavatam, fourth chapter, first purport. Proper reads what personal realization means. We'll discuss it now also. Right? So, that, that's important. We'll discuss. Uh, that question will come again. Yes, last question before we go to the next. <clears throat> About the shloka recitation, mm -hmm. we know a very classic example of Vatrasur, the person who will kill Indra instead of person who gets mm -hmm. killed by mm -hmm. the Indra. The shloka mm -hmm. meaning changes. Mm -hmm. And when we chant, we don't know what's correct, what's wrong. <laughs> so, our meaning completely changes many a times and we don't even know what meaning is changing. Mm. Like I know only one thing in the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, the Krishna means the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but Krishna means Draupadi. So when we chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra with Krishna, 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 are we calling Draupadi or are we calling Supreme Personality of Godhead? Mm. Uh, Krishna can also uh, refer to Arjuna. Arjuna yes. <laughs> Ram can refer to Balram. Correct. Ram can refer to Raghuram. Ram can refer to Parishram. <laughs> okay. Ram can refer to one of our friends also. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So in karmakandic sacrifices, this pronunciation is given more importance. Okay. Someday, one day, some disciples of Prabhupada from a different country, not India they were reciting something from Isopanishad or something like that. 
So some pandits came and told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, your disciples are not reciting it properly. Their pronunciation is not proper. Prabhupada said their pronunciation may not be proper, but their renunciation is proper. Okay. <laughs> so in karmakandic sacrifices, hmm, we may give more importance to pronunciation, but in devotional line, we give more importance to bhava, mood. In what mood are we reciting? Okay, are we reciting to please Krishna or to impress someone? So, let, don't worry so much about pronunciation. As much as possible, we should try to pronounce uh, the slokas and mantras accurately. But for some reason, because of our uh, background, uh, some slokas are like tongue twisters. Okay, Because of our inability, we may not be able to pronounce things properly. It's okay, it's perfectly all right. Communication is happening, right? Slokas are meant to communicate with Krishna, often in prayer. We have the prayer film mode, that's fine. Uh, sometimes when South Indians uh, speak English, they have certain heavy accent, right? <laughs> so, yeah, but communication is happening. <laughs> Language is meant to communicate. <laughs> it's fine. You may not speak uh, English in a certain style. And when uh, uh, people who are from, not from India, they speak Hindi, they have different accent. It's Bani Puri, they say, Bani Puri. <laughs> it's like a bit uh, too much for Indian people to accept it. Similarly, when Indians speak English, they may not be able to, you know, get it illegal. What did you say? What is that? <laughs> so, that's fine. But communication is happening, right? <laughs> so, okay. in the same way we know the Krishna and Krishna, we know the difference. So, do you know what's the difference between Hare and Hara? Or Hare? Or what's the difference between Ram and Rama? Uh, it doesn't matter as mm -hmm. long as we are chanting the name. Because whom are you indicating? Uh, when you say Hare, we are trying to invoke the blessings of Srimati Radharan. So even if the word is not pronounced very accurately uh, in the, from the perspective of a linguist or a scholar, it's fine. Radharan is listening to us. No, don't worry about it. <laughs>